What's happening? I'm Len Davis, the Seattle-based filmmaker, and I'm here in Chapala, Mexico, in, on Lake Chapala, here in Jalisco, and I'm at a gorgeous art exhibit with Deborah Kruger, who is here and going to take us around. Hola, buenas tardes. Hola, buenas tardes. Great, Thank so let's coming. start off. Can you just introduce yourself and let me know where are we on the planet and where are we here in Chapala? Sure, of course. Um, I'm Deborah Kruger. I have an international team-based studio here in Chapala where I've lived for 12 years. Um, I have a background in textile design, which I think you'll see as you look at the work, but I'm an envi my environmental artist at heart and you'll see that too. Great, and what? tell me a little bit about the building here that's housing the exhibit. Uh, this is a, a 1920s vintage train station and it was a train station briefly at its inception. It has gone through many iterations, but it has been this cultural center and now museum uh, for probably the last 15 years. And when I first moved to Chapala, I used to sit in here. They have wonderful concerts every Sunday. I used to sit here looking around going, oh, I would love to have a show here. <laughs> and here we are. Very sweet. And so we are on the edge of Lake Chapala, which is the largest lake in Mexico, right? Correct and here in the town of Chapala, which is about an hour outside of Guadalajara. Correct. Great, so let's, ta let's take a look around the exhibit. Do you want to give me some context? Um, tell me, what is the show about? What's the name of the show? Tell me about sure. the materials and the pieces, um, the and maybe we can walk around as yeah, you tell me. Yeah, we can walk around. Um, the title of the show is Avianto, and as you'll see, all my work is made with something that looks like feathers. Um, some of them look like long tail feathers, like these. And across the room, there's a piece that's made with more like plumas, more feathery kind of feathers. Okay. Um, but as you start zooming into my work, which I know you can do with the camera, you'll start to see the, the content of my work, which is endangered birds and endangered indigenous languages. There are many languages in this piece. I'm just going to point to a few that are Mayan languages. This is Yiddish, the language of my parents' uh, mother tongue. Um, what, and so what's the significance of including these languages well, and these materials? what I learned as I was doing my research about the endangered birds is that the factors that contribute to the extinction and endangerment of birds are the same factors that contribute to the extinction and endangerment of indigenous culture and language. How so? Habitat fragmentation, migration, climate change, all these things interrupt people's living patterns. And for people, for example, who lived in a rainforest and the rainforest has been cut down and that's been where they've lived for hundreds and thousands of years, what, where are they gonna go? What are they gonna do? And in less than a generation, their language, their culture, their history, Sifwe, it's gone. Hmm. So I think I'm more sensitive to that because my parents' first language was Yiddish and that, except in a few communities here and there, is a dying language and I feel regretful uh, that I wasn't taught that language and I couldn't pass that culture down to my children. So now I'm teaching them Spanish, and my grandchildren are bilingual, so that's a good thing. Nice. And so with these indigenous Mexican languages here and the materials behind you, are those, uh, what, what is the meaning uh, behind the, uh, not the significance, but the meaning behind the words that were chosen for okay. the pieces? The text that you see in most cases is the same. So the text is about some statistics about endangered birds and, you know, how many are endangered and that sort mm -hmm. of thing. And so this and is a set of wings that we see here? This is actually, I have um, a series of a number of works of mine that are based on maps. And the maps are relevant to the endangered birds. So for example, I have a whole series called the Cambodia series because the Bengal Florican, which I'll show you a little later, um, there's only like 350 or 400 left in the world and they're all in Cambodia. So by choosing a map, I'm embedding another layer about the content of the work. Cool. In this piece, this is three maps of the state of San Luis Potosi here in Mexico. So if you look, this is actually 
I'm just going to peel it back for you. So that's one map. This is another piece that continues to here. And then this is the third map. These two are exactly the same direction, and this one has been flipped backwards, and then that's the way that I've gotten this arcing shape. The reason I chose San Luis Potosí is that the coastline has a lot of rainforests, and the rainforest is under assault, as many rainforests are around the world. So um, it just seemed relevant. I live here. I love living in Mexico, and I have slowly really taken in the culture and the themes of Mexico are very much in, apparent in my work. So this is an example of a piece called Ropa Pintada. And I think you'll be able to see that it's somewhat um, reminiscent of a weepil, the which is the woven blouses that women wear in Chiapas, in Mexico, and also in Guatemala. And behind you on the other wall is a similar shaped piece but with the colors of Mexico. So whenever I can, I try to um, incorporate um, Mexican, anything about Mexico. So in this case, it's the colors of the flag. We just had our Independence Day. People love that, but I think it was like a Mexican flag type of piece here. Mm -hmm. um, and while we're here, why don't you tell me about the name Avianto? What does that mean? Um, Avianto, well, let me back up um, one or two steps. Um, this exhibition is the beginning of a traveling exhibition, and there is a consortium of 14 museums in the state of Jalisco where we are, and it's a big state. So the concept by the curator here, Gabriela Serrano, was to start the exhibition here and then travel it to other venues in Mexico. So Museos Jalisco, who I thank very much for you know, presenting this exhibition, came up with this name of Avianto, which is really a mishmash, but uh, there's a little bit of um, Italian in it, which means farewell, and since a lot of my work is about the end of things, certain things, um, if you look at it, it also happens to embed the word avian, which I think is super cool, since a lot of the work is about mm -hmm. birds. Um, so it's a good title, and um, this show will be traveling, to, as I said, to other venues. Its next one is in a city called Ciudad de Guzman, okay. and it's in a small museum that was the home of Juan Ariola, which is one of the great Mexican contemporary writers. And so his home was converted into a museum, and I will have the honor of being in that beautiful space. Right. Congratulations. Let's take a walk around. Show me some, maybe sure. you could uh, let's take me around the space. Let's take a walk down here, and then we'll hit the sculptures on the way back. What a beautiful building. It's an extraordinary building. Um, so this is another gallery. And In this gallery, we have a mix of the contemporary work that I'm doing. Um, I have smaller pieces that are framed, and I have some more historical work. When we go upstairs, you'll see even more of the historical work. And I think it was wise on the part of the curator to include that so you can see where I've come from and how the work has developed. So these are smaller pieces that still have the same theme. And because they're not museum scale pieces, they're more affordable for people, and, and that's proven to be a good strategy for me. Um, this large piece is called Devotional. It's a sister to Accidentals in the other space. It's made from four panels, and that's important because the work travels, and it, it wouldn't be able to travel if it was one large piece but I can break it up into four sections in order to travel a little bit more easily. And again, that layering sort of wing-like feather. Very much so. Um, well, a lot of my work has this very saturated color, um, once in a while I take a break from the saturated color and make work that's white, has a more, you know, more serenity to it, and it just bathes my eyes in something that's just a little more soothing. So devotional pieces in that series, as is 
this white plumeless piece across the way. Mm -hmm. And what do we have in the center of the room here? In the center here are a couple of artist books, and these are made on the screen printed pages that are at the basis of all of the feathers. And an important point that I want to make is that everything that you see in the show is screen printed, fused, recycled plastic bags. So by using recycled materials, I'm also trying to embed a narrative about the consumption that's driving a lot of this loss. So here you can see some of the solid pages of printing. And central to all my work is my drawings. And the drawings are what come when I'm taking the time to do research about the endangered birds. I read about them, I write about them, and I draw them. And then these images, in many cases, are shrunk much smaller so that we can use them effectively in a silk screen. But these books have taken... And where do you... Cl I mean, they're everywhere, so it's kind of yes. a no-brainer, but where do these materials come from? The recycled materials? Yeah. Some people collect them for me. And we can get recycled plastic bags and recycled plastic up in Guadalajara. Mm -hmm. So... Um, but here you see that we've done embroidery of the endangered bird drawings. Mm -hmm. So I, I like the challenge of doing work, doing, talking about my theme in different ways. So I can do it on this very large scale, I can do it in the smaller scales, I can do it in the artist books. And when we travel back to the um, Central Gallery, I'm going to show you some fragments of ceramic work that I've done. Great. As well. Let's check it out. Maybe while we're walking, you can just tell me a little bit about the arts community here and along Lakeside sure. and yes. what makes this particular extended community sort of artistically significant. Well, let me tell you that this has been a place of artistic creativity for a long time, probably long before there were gringos here. Um, even the, the indigenous people who lived here, we we have a museum on the other side where you see fragments of things that are found in the lake, like pottery and other things. Um, but in this particular town, this was a mecca for creatives um, like D.H. Lawrence, who came here to start writing The Plume Serpent. And there are other writers and artists of note that have come here to do their work. And um, a year or two after I arrived in Chapala, I started an artist and writer's residency called 360 Subject Itself. And while I never anticipated this, the artists and writers who come to the residency from all over the world, and they're musicians and performers and all kinds of, you know, every, every kind of creative work that you can imagine. Scholars, I have a historian here right now, Many of the older ones come here and they think, huh, maybe I should consider retiring here. So while that was never in my mind, I have inadvertently started a creative community here in Chapala that didn't exist before. Most of the creative community that you associate with the lake is in Ahihik, which is nearby. They have um, an Ahihik Society for the Arts with uh, now 300 members, both uh, Mexicans and uh, gringos from the U.S. and from Canada. Um, so this community is getting richer and richer because people are saying, I, I want to live here all year or part of the year. So it it's, it's really getting juicy. Neat. Now, I want to talk about these three sculptures. The two tall ones here are going to be part of a series of five sculptures that are all based on historical Mexican ceramic forms. Most of these forms are very small, like 12 to 18 inches. But what I have done is researched ceramic forms from different eras of Mexican ceramic history, so Olmec, Toltec, Aztec, like that, and identified forms that I found appealing and blown them up to over life size. So there'll be three more in this series and then I dress them in my feathers. So, um, and I think you'll find this interesting. We're gonna peer right into one of these. So, 
the secret to my madness is that these are actually very lightweight. They're made with building foam. And like all my work, the large work, I make sure, even as I'm starting it, that it can come apart and ship. Because I show my work all over the world. And um, moving it around is a very complicated, logistical, and expensive proposition. So. It's significant, because I can just imagine, most people who look at it probably, each of these pieces probably inherently assume that they weigh a lot. They, they and when really you see that, it's, you, you show me that, it's like, oh, it doesn't I can imagine anything. how it's and broken down. This dress-like piece is made with three sections. So there's a center section like this, and an upper section, and a lower section. Mm -hmm. and if you dig around, you'll see it's very light. Fresh. Yeah. Cool, let's take a look at some of the other stuff. And I want to just take one more look here. This is the last bitter sculptural piece. You can see this is mosaics, and if you come into this, you're going to see little fragments of drawings of, guess what, endangered birds, and I have, I have drawn all these. I did a floor installation for a couple of other shows, the last one being in Mexico City, and I had plates made at uh, a family-owned factory in Tlacopaki, and the drawings on the plates are all the endangered birds with their names, and you can see little pieces of their names here. There's the little Bengal fork, and I was talking about um, before. And I smashed all the plates, and then I made a floor installation um, with a scumbro, which is like building litter and built it up, and I wanted to try to drive home this point that how is it that we learn about lost civilization? It, it's through scraps of, of fabric, it's through scraps of pottery. This is how we reconstruct history. Well, we don't want to lose our birds. They're, we're losing them, but I wanted to create work that alludes to that loss and try to wake people up to what can we do, or what can at least we raise our awareness about and not take for granted. So I had these extra shards left, and I built my piece. Wow. Awesome. Great. Let's take a look at some of the other spaces. Okay. Let's go upstairs, and um, upstairs there's quite a few of the historical pieces which date back in most cases to when I first came to Mexico and opened my studio. So. You'll see dates like 2010, 2011, and while my work was still at that time about endangered birds, let's just say I think as my work has changed, and I hope you see this by looking at it closely, that I no longer have to declare that the work is about endangered birds and endangered languages. It's completely embedded in the work. And so, just to clarify, uh, this is ongoing themes. This is not specific to this exhibit, but in your work that Correct. goes beyond this exhibit. Correct. But what I can do that's specific to each exhibit, when I have enough time, is to collect an endangered indigenous languages from that region. So, like, the endangered birds that are in this exhibition are endangered birds in Mexico, largely. Mm -hmm. But this is an older piece of work and you can still see the feathers, but you won't see any birds. They didn't have flown in yet. And this piece, this long piece, and this long piece, clearly you can see the feathers. But when you go diving into the feathers, they're, you know, they're abstract and they're pretty but there's nothing about birds in them. So I went through a transitional stage where now the feathers are still decorative and still attractive, but the patterns in them are birds, endangered birds, endangered languages. So I feel like the work has more integration mm -hmm. now. And what a beautiful space to be able to show your work in here. They have, as I mentioned, they have concerts here and it's just, it's magical to sit and listen to music. Where's the performance space? Right down here. Oh, great, in the atrium. Right down here. And so people are sitting amongst my work and listening to fabulous music, and it's special. Amazing. And right out the window, you've got 
cows and, and with a lake behind. Mm -hmm. It's this a little hard to see through the glass, but a goat farm back here. So just beyond the trees here, yes. what you can see what is Lake Chapala. Yes, that's and right. we're at the altitude of over 5,000 feet, right? 5,200 feet. Which is part of what contributes to just an amazing, amazing year-round climate. climate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the lake uh, is surrounded by mountains. We're about an hour outside of Guadalajara, yes. the second biggest city in Mexico. It's pretty, a pretty sweet place to live. Cool. And we passed over these. Maybe you could just these tell me. These are newer pieces, um, but what's different about these is that I've taken the scraps of my own work and I've cut them into little, little plumas, little feathers, and made other pieces from them. These four, um, this little quartet was inspired by seeing the pyramid of the sun and the moon in, in uh, Mexico City last fall. And how did that tra that inspiration trans translate into these pieces? Uh, just a sense of moon, sun. Um, these are more central images, and these are images that have more of a cir circularity and then the center again. So hmm. related ways of working. Sweet. Yeah. Um, this piece that we're coming across is called um, agave, and it's an earlier piece, as you see. These and the agave, were, just put it in a little context in terms of state of Jalisco. State of Jalisco, this is where they grow agave and make, in fact, you can't call it tequila if it's not grown here. Most people don't know that. I think here and um, Oaxaca. Everywhere else it's like mezcal or other drinks, but it has to be, only tequila can be um, derived from the agave that's grown in this, this state. And, so you can see that these are the feathers turned upside down, and these are digital prints of my previous feathers, which then I convert into an agave-like thing. So I'm just always interested in, you know, using new materials and using my materials in different kinds of ways, and it's one of the fun parts of being an artist. Um, I just wrote a grant. I have an idea for a neon installation that, but I need funding for it. Now, these, this little series, and there's an, another couple down, um, down there, this is like an, another new um, effort on my part of um, somebody kept saying, you should come to our printmaking studio. And I'm like, I'm not a printmaker. And they were like, you should come. And finally it was like, fine, fine. I'll come, and if you zoom in, say to this one, you can see my birds that appear in the silk screens. And I, I mean, 15 minutes into it, I was like, this is awesome. <laughs> so I did some original prints, uh, quite a few original mono prints. And these are glissé prints that I took. And what's nice about them is it's another way to present my work. And this is a very affordable way to collect my work. So for a young collector that can't, you know, spend thousands of dollars, it's, you know, hundred dollars, so it's, it's easy. This is my older work as well. But what I like about this being in the show is that if you come in close, you'll see these waxed linen and waxed wire, I mean, wire thread and waxed linen. And this remains a texture that comes in and out of my work and has for many years. I just love that kind of hairy, wild stuff. It does its own thing, so I like that. Nice. And finally, we have a diptych, also from the printmaking series, where it's more like a nest. So um, I've had a lot of fun with these, and it really opened my own eyes, and just so I not limit myself, so I just keep trying new things. Wow, gorgeous exhibit. Yeah. So what would your, Deborah, if uh, you were to reach a wider audience with this video to, to speak to people about your work and this place, uh, any other ideas or words that you'd like to share about uh, introducing your work to the world? Obviously, you've already spoken to many themes in your uh, ideas and the materials you use, but uh, inviting people to Chapala, well, connecting I mean, with other artists certainly. or people who are using certainly. similar materials or exploring similar themes in their art? Well, I will say that if this work touches you or if you feel like the themes that I'm talking about in this work really resonate with you and you would like to see a show like this at your regional museum or a gallery, I really welcome the opportunity to travel the work. The work 
has a life of its own. It's like your children, they sort of grow up and they do their own thing. Yeah. And so I feel like that's an important component of being a community-based artist and bringing the things that I'm concerned about to the community. I'm not the only one who's worried about, you know, climate change and its impact on all of life. I'm just particularly sensitive about birds, but it, all species, including humans, are very uh, impacted by that. And I love to have an opportunity to speak to the audience and teach people about using recycled materials and speak to other artists um, about having um, a, an environmental art practice and learning how to marry their content and their form. And I feel like that's what gives work power. Nice. I will make sure to go ahead and link to your uh, website and your contact information Instagram. in the description for this video. Great. Thank you. Great. Thank you for all this time and attention. I really yeah. appreciate it's it. It's a pleasure to be with you. So again, I'm Len Davis of Seattle and now like Japala based filmmaker. And I'm here with Deborah Kruger in the town of Chapala on Lake Chapala in Jalisco, Mexico, in her exhibit, Avianto, Avianto which is open for another couple of weeks here. Yes. Thank you so much for sharing your exhibit with me. My great pleasure. Thanks for your interest. All right. Stay fresh.